And if you're good, I'm good. Good. All right. Good morning, Phil. Thank you for sitting down. I appreciate it. Good morning, Trevor. No problem. Pleasure. We are joined by Phil, the co-founder of Phil and Sebastian Coffee Company today. Phil's partner, Sebastian, is being the other co-founder, but I'll let Phil describe what Phil and Sebastian is, if people don't know what it is, and a little bit about it. Yeah, sure. So um, we are a coffee company. We have cafes. We have a coffee roasting business. So, of course, we sell prepared coffee out of our cafes, um, and then we sell coffee beans, roasted coffee beans, um, mostly in Canada, but a little bit beyond, a little bit into the States, a little bit internationally. We were founded by myself and Sebastian in 2007. We had a very humble beginning at the then Calgary Farmers Market in the Curry Barracks, and that market has since closed. Uh, but soon after we opened that location, I guess not so soon, two years after we opened that location in 2007, we opened our first cafe, sit down cafe in Loop, which is still open today. That was 2009. Um, then we opened a roasting operation at the same time. At the time we were roasting in an area of Calgary called Inglewood. Yep. And I'm just gonna just quiet my uh, stuff here. Yeah. Is, uh, <laughs> that's better for you. Don't bother us. All right. Okay, there we go. Yeah, so we started roasting in our Inglewood location. That was 2009. So we, the, in, when we started, our intention was, you know, we knew, first of all, there wasn't much for better quality coffee in Calgary, if anything. Mm -hmm. so I mean, it was a cool time in many ways. We had the benefit of being almost the only game in town. So we really didn't have any clue what we were doing. Which nice. is to say that we were really slow, for example. So we'd, we'd have people waiting like 30 minutes for a coffee at our farmer's market location. And there's just no way we could get away with that today because there's so many options. Mm. But at the time, because there were a lack of options, people kind of tolerated it and which is in the end of the day was good for us as we learned to get faster and better uh we you know we had some grace you could say at the beginning to, yeah. to learn those lessons um my background before coffee is engineering so myself and sebastian we come from we met in university um, university of calgary in like 97 so second year engineering we graduated together in 2000 and then we worked for seven years as engineers before we started the business. So we didn't have experience in retail. We didn't have experience in coffee shops. Um, it was all pretty new to us. So it was, yeah, it was the grace of our customers yeah. back in 2007 that allowed us to kind of learn, get better, and uh, eventually be able to operate, you know, I think pretty well today. Obviously, we're always trying to figure out how to get better, mm -hmm. but certainly we're a lot faster <laughs> and we're able to do better, much better quality today than we did back in 2007. Anyway, so yeah, we, we opened our Martin Loop location in 2009, and then we opened a location in the expansion of Chinook uh, Shopping Mall in 2010. And then uh, fa fast forward to 2013, we opened our location in Mission on 4th Street. Mm -hmm. um, and then 2015, we opened our location, the Simmons building where I'm sitting right now, this yeah. cool brick background behind me. Yeah. Uh, and then about a year and a half later, we moved our roasting operations from the Inglewood to, to the Simmons where it resides now. So if people come to the Simmons, they can see our roasting, our roaster machine behind a glass wall, um, wearing a mask. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's the way things are right now. But um, yeah, that was 15. And then um, two years later, we opened our location on Stephen Avenue. And then 2019, we opened our, um, sorry, yeah, 19, we opened our location in um, Calgary Place downtown. And then yep. 
uh, just recently we opened our um, a bakery, basically a bakery for donuts. Like we started another company called Hoopla Donuts. Yep. In 2019. That's a that's a brief history of time yeah. of Don Sebastian uh, over basically the last 13 years, which has been a roller coaster, uh, quite the journey from again really simple small tiny little operation with just myself and sebastian manning our booth um to before covid happened we had 72 72 staff um covid hit us pretty hard we sh shrunk down we had to lay off 52 staff what wow. during covid now thankfully we've brought a lot of people back cool. but a lot of people so that's yeah coming back online oh. good yeah that was that was, that dealt a serious blow felt like uh a plane yeah crashing down to earth uh that thankfully we were able to to grab the controls and yeah save it before for uh doom yeah. But it was, yeah around march was pretty scary pretty scary time to see that business that you spent 13 years building really on the precipice of, of collapse. Was yes. Awful. <laughs> but one of the, one of the questions that our little companies asked ourselves is whether a cafe would make sense. Yeah. Do you think opening cafes has made sense looking back or is it something maybe you'd think twice about going forward or is it good for business? Context of COVID or you mean just in general with the coffee business? Yeah. I mean, again, so when we opened the cafe, we were, basically the only quality player um so we it, it made perfect sense for us to open a cafe i mean and that was one of our reasons for existing as a business was to offer calgarians an alternative that we hmm. thought a better quality alternative and show the potential of, of quality coffee yeah it's, it's since broadened and now we want to still do that we still believe strongly in showing the potential of coffee Calgarians, but we also want a wider berth. We want to explore and push the whole specialty coffee industry um, and challenge mm -hmm. the world scale. So our ambitions have grown since then, but it, it really hasn't changed where things started for us, which was let's show Calgarians what, how much better coffee can be than what they've been become accustomed to. They've defined as like that black, kind of bitter drink that wakes them up in the morning. Yeah. There was a function of getting them started, but it doesn't really taste all that good until you add things like cream and sugar. <laughs> like everything tastes good. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It doesn't taste good when you add cream and sugar to it. Yeah. So uh, dirt, dirt tastes pretty good. Pretty yeah. Good. So yeah, I mean, it can taste good all by itself with nothing added. And that, that was our, um, kind of our credo at the beginning and it's still our credo today. So that necessitates cafes. And I think hmm. in many ways, even though cafes have been a big challenge, obviously they require a lot of staff, which is always a challenge in terms of, you know, keeping your staff happy and all the training involved and really dealing with the customer service aspect is tricky. Retail yeah. is, you know, it's kind of, it's unrelenting and sometimes a bit vicious um, dealing with, customers day in day out and some of them most of our customers are amazing so yeah. that's that we've been lucky that way but you know obviously that's it is difficult so i wouldn't i would if i was to go back in time i would still open cafes as we did i think i mean we've learned a lot of lessons along the way i started as a coffee guy and i'm still a coffee guy for sure but i had mm -hmm. to learn business i didn't have business background i didn't have business experience I had engineering right. experience and I kind of applied logic to our decisions and so does Sebastian. But we ultimately had to learn how to market, how to do everything that comes to running a business. Mm -hmm. So we made mistakes along the way and tried to not duplicate them. <laughs> yeah. possible. Did, did you grow up wanting to be an entrepreneur or was it more engineering that you leaned towards? Uh, I definitely wanted to be an entrepreneur from a really early age. I remember... I, I had a number of businesses when I was young. When I was about um, 10 years old, I started a business selling uh, pop at a golf course. This is cool. when you do such things. Now you yep. never do that. 
but there was a, a hole in the, like in the fence of the ninth hole of, um, what's the name of the golf course? It's eluding me now. It was many years ago. Yeah. Maybe 32 years ago. But um, yeah, there, and I, I set up a cooler and I sold pop and that was my first business. So I definitely had an entrepreneurial desire. My dad owned a business. Sebastian's dad also owned his own business. So we come from sort of entrepreneurial families, but we, we both knew we wanted to, to run a business. And I, mean, I think that in many ways that common uh, desire uh, brought us yeah. together. Um, in, a, in, a, in a partnership and and to this day it's allowed us to stay strong and that both of us are engaged we want to do it we enjoy it uh, you know there's there's uh, I think the number one thing about being a business owner is is adaptation mm. you have to be able to adapt because you never know what's coming at you you know like that's COVID is a perfect example you know you have to be able to pivot and adapt and adjust and but that's just one example i mean we've been doing it for 13 years adapting and pivoting you have this challenge this problem yeah. this you have to deal with okay adapt change okay what how should you make the best decision possible okay oh it wasn't the right one okay adapt pivot yeah. change and i think in my opinion the people that are drawn to business and succeed in business are those people that have the drive to do it and the ability to adapt yeah, for sure. those things then really you can do it and for me um i just got lucky and that i'm passionate about coffee passionate about our product and what we do um and then the uh, you know i love i love the challenge of adapting and yeah uh of you know, never and the unpredictability of not knowing what's coming is actually kind of appealing to me in a so, weird masochistic way <laughs> yeah did you always know you wanted to try coffee or how did you get into the coffee business what was that yeah, definitely I, <laughs> I remember i discovered coffee in university it was uh actually f first year engineering i discovered coffee yep. i was falling asleep in my classes uh, i really was I super interested in them, but I just was so tired because it was such hard work and yeah. long nights and not much sleep. And I remember my friend, uh, Mark, who I haven't seen in years, he said, why don't you just drink some coffee? Yeah. Like it was obvious. I had never drunk coffee in my life to that point. And so I went to the little cafeteria, the engineering lounge, and I grabbed a coffee and it was so awful. It tasted <laughs> so bad. Uh, but it worked. Kept yep. me so I added, you know, cream and sugar and the thing that everyone does to make coffee palatable. And I drank it to stay awake. Um, and then slowly I kind of happened upon, um, there's actually um, a cool story on our website called the Epic Story that talks a bit about this, but I- I read it, yeah. Oh, cool. I happened upon a book from my uncle, my late uncle, Billy, uh, about making espresso coffee. It was, by an author named David Schomer, mm -hmm. um, owned a cafe. I, I don't even know if his cafes are still open, but he owned a cafe in Seattle called Vivace. Anyway, he, he wrote about how amazing coffee could taste. And it was my first sort of introduction to the possibility that coffee could actually taste good and not need uh, tremendous amounts of modifiers like cream, sugar, and whatever, what have you, uh, caramel, macchiatos and these kind of things to make it taste palatable um so that became an exploration and both sebastian and i are very curious and we kind of tend to lure each other into the things we're into <laughs> and got each other down that rabbit hole and uh, curiosity to see what it could taste like and then just never really looked back kept kept sort of digging and every every time we take a shovel of dirt out of the ground uh, the, the proverbial shovel and dirt out of the ground, we see more and get more interested in what's there. And there's just so much to it. So absolutely ongoing exploration. You worked as engineers for half a dozen years before you started Bill and Sebastian? Seven years. So we graduated uh, year 2000, which was 
a crazy time to graduate. Uh, yes. It was the, the peak of the dot-com bubble. There were so many jobs. Uh, it was, people, you know, companies had job fairs because they were desperate to attract new recruits. Uh, the salaries were way higher than they should have been. For Especially as an engineer in the dot-com era, I would uh, imagine. Yeah. For the lack of qualifications that we had. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the heyday of uh, of being in that field. So him and I, we had kind of our pick of the litter. We jumped into a new startup division of Panasonic, uh, huh. here in Calgary, which was was interesting. Eventually, they actually closed the office in Calgary a year year and a half later. And then I worked in Los Angeles for a bit, and then and then I kind of tended to I realized I liked smaller companies better. Yeah. I moved to Germany for a while, just in itself a long story. Yeah. <laughs> I, I traveled around Europe to learn about wine because I was really interested in wine as well by myself for six months. And then I ended up staying in Germany for a year. I worked there in Germany uh, as an engineer on uh, cool. gas detection sensors. Just huh. kind of, and then I came back to Calgary and that was pretty much great when we started doing research for starting the company so yeah we i worked at maybe like five or six engineering companies during that short seven year stint partly because again the industry was very hot but also volatile mm. so you had these companies that were hiring 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 and then they shut down an office hire 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 and then let a whole bunch of people go it was just nuts you know it was really volatile um both Sebastian and I were actually not uncomfortable with that because we we can handle the risk. I mean, that's why we started a business. The risk is okay for us. So we became, even at a super young age, we became contractors and we kind of liked the idea of doing a project and going to a different company. And, um, and that actually became appealing for us, which was a really neat experience because we got to experience lots of different companies and, different cultures, company cultures. And uh, again, I got to work in, in Los Angeles and then in, in Southern part of Germany, which was really neat experience. Um, so in yeah. the end, it all fed into our, our approach to how we created our own business. And that gave us I think, a good set of diverse experience to, to start from. What was the experience like starting Phil and Sebastian? Was it a big risk? Did you have to go out on a limb? Well, I mean, as I said, we were, we were independent contracting as engineers, which meant that really the risk wasn't that high because we started in a farmer's market. So pretty low investment. Um, we had, we spent some money on the booth, but we did the work ourselves and along with some family members that helped us. Uh, so that was pretty mitigated. We just used our own money. We had some money saved up. Um, it was just us at the beginning working there. And we always knew that we could pick up engineering contracts if something didn't work out. Mm -hmm. So it didn't feel that risky. But you know, it's interesting. When I think back, I was kind of ready to move on from mm. engineering. And it wasn't that I didn't enjoy it. It was that there's just stuff missing for me. I remember um, at this very, I think I would say poignant moment, I was working at one of my engineering jobs and I was sitting in my gray cubicle and I'd realized at that moment that it had been um, almost three days since I really had a conversation with another human being. <laughs> You're like in front of your computer, I'm a computer engineer. In front of your computer writing code, uh, you can communicate in the virtual world. Mm -hmm. This is not, I'm, I want to be more sociable. I want to interact with people. I want to yeah. be and talk to people. This is just something is really missing. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember this is again, really, I think you know, it was important for me that same time that I had the realization that I hadn't really spoken to another human being, <laughs> I was really enjoying my coffee breaks. So I, I work, I was, I worked really hard on what I did, but I take a break and I had a little hand grinder and I'd go to the kitchen and I grind up my own coffee and I do a pour over. And I remember, I still remember how those coffees tasted. I don't remember the work I was doing. I don't remember the details of, even though I worked really hard, I don't remember the details of the work I was doing. I remember 
every, how every sip of those coffees tasted. So I think that, that sealed the deal for me. Mm-hmm. That is when I knew that this is sort of the direction I should go because A, I felt there was a, a social aspect really missing to my job. And obviously I cared more about the coffee than I do about my, my software development, even though, again, you know, I worked really hard. Yeah. So that, the interesting thing is I've actually been able to marry the two things now because I do a, a lot of software development for our company. So I've probably done maybe 25 different software projects across the last 13 years, and I'm working on three or four of them right now. And I designed our designed and built our our latest coffee roaster, huh. coffee roasting machine. So it's been really actually highly advantageous that I had those. I, I enjoyed doing it, and I had those skills, and now I can take them and I can combine them with my love of coffee and um, desire to to run a business and kind of bring bring it all together, if you so to speak. You ever thought about going back to software? It seems it's a pretty lucrative career and there's a lot of opportunity in that sector these days. Well, like I said, I am, I'm in it. Like ah. I'm just, I've, there's a new industry that, that Sebastian and I have created, it's coffee engineering. Yes. It's an interdis- interdisciplinary field of engineering. I've done a number of talks at the University of Calgary about it actually. About Good. coffee engineering and this sort of interdisciplinary approach to you have mechanical engineering and chemical engineering and electrical engineering and um you have all these different elements coming together and Mm -hmm. it's a practical application that's Um, cool so and like i said i've i've you know i developed software for seven years and i'm 100 percent certain that none of this stuff that i've worked on is still in use yeah every single piece of software i've written the 25 different programs is all being used in my company Right. And that some of the programs have evolved and I wrote them 10 years ago and I've been evolving them ever since. Yeah. And so, you know, that's way more gratifying to me. I mean, one thing that I didn't like about working in software is that it moves so fast that things become obsolete quickly. So you can spend years working on a project and then you, you know, it's only around for six months and then it's obsolete and it's replaced by something else. And that's not, it's not like you built a building and it's there and it's indelible and everlasting and you can go look at it and feel good about it. It's intangible. It sits inside computer hard drives and, yeah. and again, it sort of hits the waste bin when it becomes obsolete. And that was one of my number one grievances working in the software industry is that you invest, I kind of thought, what's the point? You know, as an industry, everything moves forward, right? the collective move forward and it's tech tech's been great. I mean, there's problems with the tech, but there's amazing things too. Um, but as an individual working in it, you it can be really unsatisfying if everything just is just becoming obsolete. Right. So I actually find that I'm having a product. Yeah. I'm enjoying so much more the kind of tech that I do in the context of our business. Yeah, absolutely. And, than I ever did um, when I was a sort of like quote unquote official engineer. Right. So, and again, I'm probably in some ways doing more of it than, than ever. So right. um, I am still in software. I am still in tech. I am still in engineering. Um, I'm just doing it in a totally different context. I read that, well, the founder of Shopify, Toby Slutke, he was uh, obviously a tech guy but he started as a soft or a snowboard company. That's right. And they wrote the software for their online shop and turned around and were like, whoa, like maybe this is a better business. <laughs> so I'm maybe that'll happen to Phil and Sebastian. You never know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that that's, that's it. You, you, again, I think entrepreneurial people, they're attracted to solving problems. They're attracted to adapting. They see things that need, problems problems that need to be solved and they want to be the ones to solve them and they have the drive to do it Mm. Uh, that's sort of what ends up steering them in that direction and that's exactly how we operate i mean that's kind of how for example our donut company was founded 
So we saw, I was n never into donuts. Mm. I didn't care about them. I don't have a sweet tooth. <laughs> my love, my passion was coffee. And the reason, but the reason why we ended up getting into donuts was um, largely in part due to our baker, who's very talented. Um, she, she challenged us and, and Sebastian had some influence here too, for sure. But she said, we should look at donuts because they can be really tasty. And my immediate reaction was, I don't think so. I'm, yeah. I'm skeptical, right? Well, it's a good business too, obviously. Well, yeah, good business. But like, I don't care about doing a good business if I don't care about the product. Right. It has to be, it has to be a combination of the two. I mm -hmm. have to feel like it's, because for me, this is, this is how I define business. I should have add great value to someone's life. They should be able to come, give me their money, and I should give them 700% value. Yeah. Getting. Because otherwise, what's the point? I mean, that's, that's how all this stuff began. Someone had a skill of, they were a blacksmith. Someone was, you know, they, they traded furs and people traded products. They had an expertise, they had a need, and then they traded. Um, and then that's kind of how business was born. And to me, the truest, purest form of business is I have a great product. It's great quality. It's great value. And I need to make some money, but I want you to feel like to me, value is about how much you get for the dollar spent. Mm -hmm. you, should get, you should feel like you're getting so much for that. Mm -hmm. And I believe strongly in creating value and everything that we sell, everything that we do as a business is about how, providing amazing value for your dollar. Mm -hmm. So yes, maybe we're more expensive than Starbucks, but we're, we're not 700% more expensive, but we are definitely 700% more value in my opinion. Absolutely. So much more for that product and that, so the same thing applies to everything we sell and of course donuts. So for me, of course the business has to work. I, you know, the business model needs to work, but I need to feel like I'm doing great product where I can offer amazing value for the dollar spent. So she sent me on a little expedition to taste donuts mm -hmm. around different places in the U S mostly, um, to different kind of craft, if you will, craft donut shops. And, and then I became convinced that they could actually be really good. Yeah. It's amazing. And then yeah. yeah, great product and offer great value. And then obviously the business had to make sense and it did. So it became a combination of those, those two. I'm, I don't think I'll ever love donuts as much as I love coffee. That's just not going to happen. But I believe strongly that we have amazing donuts and we offer great value. Um, and so and we saw the need to adapt and add another important product to our offering um, to sort of take the strain of having one core product. Do you think it's do you think it's possible to use business to support causes other than yourself? That was one thing that we tried to I've been trying to do at Rose Bros is get back to the environment a little bit with reforestation. Okay. Yeah, I mean I think I think that's great. I think again for me, my philosophy has always been if businesses did engaged in really better practices as businesses, what I might call like ethical, ethical business, ethical business to me means not what you can write on your website or what you can market. It means the core of what you're about. Mm -hmm. So for example, the way we buy coffee is I want everyone that we buy coffee from to be thriving, not getting by, not fair, not doing all right. You know, like those words, yeah. like when's the last time you were happy about fair? Yeah. fair Fair trade or the idea of fair to me is kind of the bare minimum. That doesn't sound very exciting or I, I think. Yeah, the, for sure. A farmer that we work with can thrive mm -hmm. if, if they can be in a situation where they're thriving. That's the, should be the goal. So if, if that's our goal, okay, we want to buy great coffee. We want our producing partners to thrive. Everyone we work with to really be thriving then if that's our model and if that is the model of more people that run a business, then I would argue that we probably need a lot less charity in the world. Yeah. Because yeah. 
many ways, charity comes about and becomes necessary when there's exploitation or when there's, hmm. when there's not the same investment in, in, in that desire to have things thrive. Um, but having, having causes and things you care about and what you're doing with your tree planting is, is great. Like to me, that amounts to it's a similar philosophy. It's to say business shouldn't be about making money. It should make money as a byproduct of what you're doing. Mm. You should be adding value. So you're adding value by planting trees that adds value, right? So uh, I'm trying to add value by having an amazing quality product and making sure that everyone I work with is, is thriving. Um, doesn't mean I don't believe in charity and we do charity um, because I think it's still powerful and important, but I really still strongly believe that we would need less charity if there was more people that just weren't just about making money. They were about right. trying to improve the world because that's what it should be about. If you're not improving the world with your business and you're not actively doing that, then you're probably doing the opposite. Actually, you're probably degrading it probably kind of sucking from it yeah yeah yeah. i think it should be about all the things a good business is which is great customer service and you know great marketing good products yeah you're running running your operation well a tight ship and you should be profitable mm -hmm. but i don't think you should be profitable at the expense of doing the right thing and operating your business with integrity and and really thinking how, how am I, like, how did I make the world a better place today? Yeah. If yeah. I can't answer that question. Oh man. I think that uh, things have gone astray and um, that's always been the basis of how we operate and what we care about and, and our decision-making. So again, without, without revealing trade secrets, have you found that has been kind of differentiator for Phil and Sebastian? Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm not worried about revealing trade secrets in the sense that uh, everything that we've done with coffee has been very hard fought, hard won. You know, every step that we've taken has taken years to achieve. So I would say that if people want to do the things that we do, like for example, with the exception of COVID, yeah. uh, we, we travel to every origin we buy from multiple times a year and we have real relationships with every grower that we work with. We eat dinner with their family. We play with their kids. We, we have, we have our own kids, but yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we have real relationships and we, we, we are really in, engaged and invested in making sure that they are thriving. Mm. So that does necessitate uh, higher prices that we pay mm. those farmers because uh, you need to be pay, paying good prices to have someone thrive. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And that also necessitates some, a little bit higher prices on our side too. Mm -hmm. um, and then all the while, it's really, everything we do is based around quality. Because I really believe having that as the central point, um, it holds, it's the glue that holds everything together. Because mm -hmm. if I go down to wherever, Guatemala, and I work with a coffee farmer, and they're a great person, and I pay them a lot of money, good money, let's just say good money, good, good money, they're doing well, but the quality of the product I'm getting is not good. Then how can I turn around and feel like I'm offering 700% value? Yeah. To back in Calgary? It's a bit of a broken system, but if I can work with those coffee farmers to improve quality, solve problems, make the coffee better, you know, do all of that, then I can create a product that has 700% value and that I'm just on a video conference. I'm doing interview. Okay. Is it urgent? It's not, it's not an interview. Don't worry. It's a conversation. There's no rules. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's urgent. One second. Oh yeah. Uh, actually that would kill my feet right now. Are you sure it's the internet? Cause it's working for me. Can you tether for just like 10 minutes and I'll do it? Is your phone? Is that okay? Yeah. Sorry. Um, I kind of lost my train of thought there. Well, I just, I mean, for instance, one of the challenges that Rose Bros Coffee has is 
coffee is quote unquote a commodity. And so the challenge is how do you differentiate yourself? Do you think that focusing on quality and yeah. process from start to finish is enough? Um, I mean, the, the short answer is it's not enough to, to just do that exclusively, but it is essential. Mm -hmm. uh, I personally think that, again, without quality is the basis, the foundation, um, thing, other things sort of fall short, but, but you can't, you can't allow customers to receive quality without having the nice branding around it and good storytelling. And, and then you can't do all that if you're a jerk and is not offering good customer service. So you, you need to be uh, empathetic and understanding. Um, I also, one thing that we learned in the beginning is we were very zealous, uh, we were you know, excited and impassioned and we were home aficionados, but we were a little intimidating in the beginning like, as zealots, as zealots can be. And yeah. we were very impassioned. I remember one very uh, sort of story in my mind that stuck with me and I, caught, I was working till this is the early days, probably, you know, only a few months after we opened in 2007, a customer came up to me and said, I would like a regular coffee, please. Mm -hmm. my response to that was there's nothing regular about our coffee right yeah <laughs> and that's probably good for you <laughs> yeah, like i was just i was impassioned and yeah but it kind of the this sort of blank face on the customer was like i just want a coffee Can, i don't need a lecture i don't want all of this and and it just so what we learned to do was be a little more gentle and allow people to to ease into what we were trying to do and have a, a path to sort of segue from their own coffee experiences into something that we were trying to do and just be a, not jam it down people's throats and be a little more gentle with the application. So again, this is all a part of it. So you, you need to have quality. You need to be continuously working on it. Uh, you need to have the branding and the marketing. You need to have the customer service. Uh, you need to have, you know, great staff uh, that are happy at their job. Otherwise they can't possibly give good customer service. Um, you need to have the full package. Otherwise you, that's, that's the recipe for success. Um, is, is it all in right. company. And otherwise your weakest link will, will pull you down. So if you have an amazing product, but you have an ugly bag, people will have a hard time believing that it's an amazing product. Right. You have a beautiful bag, but the product inside isn't good. People think you're a fraud or that you're just sort of, you know, not the real deal, not authentic. So again, it's sort of the combination of everything. When you look around, do you have other coffee companies that you kind of look towards or were inspired by? Yeah, for sure. I mean, especially in the early days, but even now, um, I've always been inclined to look fairly internationally. Yeah. Um, so most of my inspiration really comes from outside North America in many ways. Um, Scandinavia is a place I look to a lot. I have some friends there that are running really impressive businesses. There's a, one company called Co the Coffee Collective out of uh, Denmark, Copenhagen, Denmark. And I was just in Copenhagen last summer, I think it was, um, and visiting them. They're, they're friends of ours and just I really appreciate what they're doing. I think they, they embody the combination of quality and good business ethics yeah. to, the, to the core of what they're about um, to, to the nth degree. Mm. So that really inspires me, both in terms of quality, but also just the way they make their decisions about doing the right thing. Um, just, you know, high, high integrity individuals. Right. And that has become, in many ways, you know, in the beginning, I was like, okay, where's the best quality? And that's what inspired me. But you know what, now it's more about, okay, who's, who has this combination of the best quality and this really high integrity in their decision-making? Hmm. Uh, and then they can actually run a good business. Yeah, and that, for sure. That's like the, the, the holy triangle, the holy trinity of, you know, have your run a great business, high ethical standards, do great quality. Yeah. That's been what I've aspired to, uh, 
um, toward for our business and Sebastian too. So um, yeah, that, that's, that's really where we've kind of landed in terms of what we're about. How have you guys dealt with the growing saturation in the coffee market in Calgary and in general? I mean, we have some advantages of being an early player, so that helps more re name recognition has been good. But I, again, I think it's really about continuous improvement and involvement. Mm. So if, if we didn't continuously improve, improve and evolve, we would become obsolete and we would just get uh, passed by our competition. So it, it's, it would happen anyway, but it's even more important in a competitive environment mm -hmm. to continuously evolve and challenge yourself to make things better and not just your quality, but your service and your design of your cafes and the way you operate your business and what you do for your staff to keep them engaged and interested and you know, all aspects of running a good business. That's just the nature of it. And if you don't do those things, then I, I, again, I really believe that you can't keep things the same mm. You can't say, Oh yeah, we're trying to keep our quality. If you are trying to keep your quality, it's, it's going to degrade. You have to be trying to improve it. You have to be constantly yeah. trying to make it better. Um, there's something, the law of nature, the law of entropy, whatever you want to call yeah, it, for sure, mm -hmm. fall apart and degrade in time. And you need to actively work to um, combat that. And that's the essence of running any kind of quality operation, I think. So yeah, that, that's in many ways how we've dealt with it. And we've, again, had to adapt. So if we are challenged uh, in Calgary, because there's a lot of competition now then you know we look outside to the rest of canada to sell co more coffee outside of calgary too mm -hmm. and even products of maybe a softer economy in alberta then we've looked to adapt and again try to take advantage of the fact that the economy has been better in say ontario or quebec mm -hmm. um, and even bc in some ways than alberta <laughs> yeah the last yeah time. So, good have thought <laughs> and, and so that adaptation has been key to our, to our uh, ability to continue uh, doing well. Who do you look towards for business inspiration? Is there anyone or any readings you have that you kind of lean on? Um, again, it depends on if I'm looking at what I might call the execution side of business. So the decisions about uh, what to offer, the standard of service. Um, if I'm looking at sort of the online sphere, then I do tend to gravitate towards some of the bigger companies like the Googles and Amazons hmm. to say, wow, that's so impressive what they're doing. And now when it comes to how to run a business in an ethical manner, <laughs> I'm not usually looking in the same direction, but yeah, uh, that's a little different story. <laughs> a bit of a different story. So again, I've been a believer that, you know, I like to, I'm, I'm cherry picking in the sense that I'm looking at a business like Amazon saying, okay, well, there's lots yeah. of, well, things that they're doing and impressive things and and i think they're they've set a, a standard and a model in many ways for the online business world do i agree with a lot of the ways they choose to run and their business and their in sort of internal ethics no i yeah. don't um does that mean that i should ignore the things that they do well that would seem foolish so yes. i i look at some of the things they're doing well and i try to recontextualize that in the context of trying to run a business that has uh, core, core values that are a bit different, but, um, but still utilizes that as a benchmark in terms of standard of service. We, we'd offer the same day coffee service, for example, yeah. many ways inspired by how streamlined Amazon is with their ability to, to, to deliver online products. So that is something I think it's important to look at that um, and be measuring yourself against the highest standard in any aspect of what you're trying to do in your business. I've seen Phil and Sebastian ranks pretty high on Amazon.ca actually. We're always, uh, we've enjoyed selling on Amazon and think it's great and notice that you guys are there and obviously you put the time into selling on that platform. Yeah, I, Amazon's like selling on actual Amazon platform has been for sure positive it's also been challenging because um they take amazon, a lot <laughs> yeah, amazon but also you know it's sort of like on their terms right yep so 
whole room, which of course makes sense. But if you want to do things like make sure the coffee is fresh when it's arriving to your customers, that's been challenging to get them to rotate, uh, order the right amount of coffee. Yeah. So that's been my number one challenge with Amazon is trying to make sure that our customers ordering there are getting fresh coffee, yep. which has always been the case. But uh, that's, you know, again, it comes with positive and negative. It's been good, like especially in the context of COVID. Mm. You know, channels like Amazon, like grocery to, to sell coffee um, in addition to our own platform. So I certainly can't complain about that. Are there any core beliefs or principles that Phil and Sebastian hold that may be counterintuitive to the coffee world and business in general? Counterintuitive. Um, I mean, I suppose it depends on the point of view. Like I would say the average coffee business if you just sort of take the big, big coffee operation, they're effectively trying to buy coffee at more or less the lowest price they can mm -hmm. for the quality they're trying to obtain. And then they're trying to sell it for the highest price they can for the quality they can kind of get away with. Um, our model has been different than that. We are, we are looking at each individual producer we work with and each country they live in. And we're looking at setting prices based on what we think are the right prices to be paid to those people. Mm -hmm. And there are times when I even negotiate up and that is extremely un, <laughs> un yeah. in the coffee industry with the exception of maybe people like the coffee collective, like I mentioned, that will offer to pay more than even what's asked. And they said, that's not enough. You should actually, your standards should be higher for the price you're asking because the quality you're offering is exceptional. Right. Pay it according. So, that is extremely uncommon. Now I have, we have to manage that carefully and balance that against our business needs. Um, so it's not like we can go around just sort of paying whatever. And I do always want to measure that against quality because I think incentivizing quality through price in a, in a proper way, not a way where you kind of hold hostage a producer, which can happen, but in a proper way is, is a positive thing ultimately. For, for all people involved. Hmm. What to you makes good coffee? Pardon me? What, what to you makes a good cup of coffee as the owner of a coffee company? Yeah, I, I, the answer I think is again, you know, I, I read articles and they, they tend to simplify it, right? It, sort of like you, the number one heading you hear on an article in whatever culinary magazine is how to make the perfect cup of joe or whatever yeah <laughs> certainly the word perfect does not belong there just like uh perfect doesn't belong in how to make the perfect meal like there's no yeah. concept of perfect meal yeah um, little clickbait there yeah exactly right the concept of a perfect cup is sort of not it's not possible you can make an excellent cup and, and again it's it comes down to weakest link um it's about the alignment of all the important variables that result in the good tasting coffee. So it starts on the farm. It starts with the type of tree planted. It starts with how it's cared for. It starts with how it's harvested and, and how it's um, uh, processed. And then it's how does it arrive to us in Canada? And is it fresh still when it arrives? Has it been handled properly? Um, we, we freeze all of our green coffee to keep it fresh. Yeah, I read that, yeah. Preserve it. So that is a big, important part for us because a lot of the time when people finally get to drinking that coffee, it's actually harvested a year before or however long before, and so it's really faded or has off flavors. So how fresh is it there? Then it's roasted. How is it, is it roasted properly? Is it roasted well? Um, and then how fresh is that? And then it has to be brewed. And then what kind of water do you brew with? And how are you grinding it? And how are you brewing it? And, and then it has to be, I mean, people often omit this stage, but it has to be drunk in a way that gives you, let's say, some awareness. Or it has to be drunk with awareness. If you just kind of consume a coffee for, for the caffeine or whatever, even if it's great, I mean, yeah. I don't ever really enjoy it. You have to be in the right state of mind to say, yeah, I'm going to slow down for a moment. And even if it's only for one minute, 
um, to just pay attention. Mm -hmm. uh, require, it requires some attention on, on the part of the person drinking it. So, mm -hmm. and again, if any of those things are missing, um, it could still be okay. But if enough of them are missing, it's never really going to be good. And so, in order to really, and so our, the way I see our job is it, 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 it is complicated, but I want to try to make it a bit less complicated for the average consumer because I don't, I don't expect them to love coffee as much as me, to put as much attention into it. They have other things that they're thinking about. Maybe they like coffee, but they also have yeah. other things. Like, you know, they want to hang out with their friend at our coffee shop. They, they don't, they come. Yeah, for sure. Good, but <clears throat> their primary purpose is not drinking great coffee. It's hanging out with their friend. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so hmm. I want to create an environment where it's sort of simple for them, or as simple as possible, while not oversimplifying. Encapsulates so, all the details. Yeah, exactly. Encapsulates the details. So they can enjoy it without having to fuss and worry too much. And, and we can do as much of the legwork behind the scenes, again, without uh, needing to jam down people's throats. Oh, we did this and we did this. Yeah. And our water and did this and this and you know the information is there for people to consume uh we make sure it's there but we don't kind of like ram it down their throats and because we know that they want to enjoy great coffee and you know work on their their social studies homework i don't know yeah. whatever so phil and sebastian is a successful coffee company now but i'm sure there's been some ups and downs along the way has there been any failures quote-unquote failures that have maybe you had a silver lining or you've learned from that have set you up for future success? I mean, I think what I'm, you know, COVID is a perfect example right now. I mean, it, it was extremely painful uh, to go through that ordeal of being at the edge of collapse and needing to make all these really abrupt, quick changes and needing to do all these temporary layoffs with the staff that are really important to us and yeah. who want to them and we just like I mean it felt like we kicked them to the curb it was it was horrible um, there's little we could do thankfully we have a, a government here that stepped in to help um, but I felt like I was doing a disservice every single time I did a temporary layoff to a staff member I felt like I was just like saying you know you're the government's problem you know it's like yeah. good luck that felt horrible mm -hmm. but the outcome from all of this stuff has been to review every decision we've made, everything we've done as a company, every way which we've chosen to operate and, and revisit everything. Everything's on the table. And as we hopefully, I mean, we're not emerged from COVID, but as we emerge, I hope that we can um, tighten everything up and make it all operate better. And again, those things, you know, sometimes you operate in a certain way just because you have, not because you should. Yeah. So, I think in many ways it's it will at the exit of it uh, i hope that it will allow us to be able to be stronger operate better and yeah just be a better company overall so do you have any favorite books or favorite podcasts you recommend to other entrepreneurs or coffee experts i am a huge fan of malcolm gladwell yeah so i just layers <laughs> all his stuff up so he has a really cool podcast uh, he, I mean, okay. he's written lots of books, um, and he has a really cool podcast, so I would encourage people to check that out. Huh. Uh, he studies sort of, it's called, um, rep, uh, what's it called? It's slipping my he's, mind. A, he's all about the outliers, right? Like the, uh... It's called Revisionist History. Okay. So the premise of the podcast is that he looks at events in the past that have been sort of misreported in, ser in terms of what people have come to think of them. Uh, and you, he, stu he studies them and sort of relitigates them in some circumstances, but kind of tries to get to the bottom of what really happened in that scenario. Hmm. And it's not just about outliers. Partly it's about outliers. Sometimes it's about underdogs, but Great. it's mostly about, um, you know, misunderstood or misrepresented stories from history and, and also oversimplified stories from history so yeah. uh anyway I, I love his stuff i love the way he thinks um so that's my my go-to i've been uh, fairly intrigued over the last few years of 
by the whole um, insanity of U.S. politics. Mm. So I listen to a few of U.S. politics podcasts, mm -hmm. not right now with COVID. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Things. Um, so, but mostly it's been revisionist history and uh, his books, and I don't do that much um, a pleasure free reading, unfortunately, these days. It's also, I have three kids, three young kids. Yeah, that's tough. <laughs> it's my time when I'm not working, so. Yeah. Best advice you were given starting the business. Do you have anything that sticks out? Best advice. Um, I mean, some of it is really basic stuff. It has to do a lot with um, financial planning. So some of the best advice I got was to create really sound financial projections and plans behind every decision you make. Uh, and that includes starting your whole, your whole business, right? Whether it's starting your business or decisions you make in the business to create sound financial models and financial plans yeah. before you jump, before you, before you choose to do things. Um, and that will serve you very well. And you might be wrong, but you're way better off by looking at something from a solid financial planning point of view um, than just sort of jumping in with your gut because it's surprising how many times your gut can be wrong and you might not have that, the, you know, the proper foundation behind it. So mm. I would say that was a big one. Um, I think, I mean, this is not a piece of advice that was given to me, but it's a hard learned lesson yeah. is to have empathy and you're in a business in we're in our business of, of offering a product to customers. So you need to have empathy for those customers. Like what's their point of view? Where are they coming from? If you can't meet your customers where they are, then I think you're hopeless. Yeah. In many ways you are, you, you're going to hit, you're going to hit a wall. You're going to hit a barrier. So being able to have that empathy and, whether it be when someone walks into our coffee shop or whether it be when they order online or whether they have a problem with their order or whatnot, what being, being empathetic and being able to, again, identify with those concerns. And um, I heard this phrase that I think stuck with me, which is um, their problems become my problems. Yeah. So that's I think the essence of good customer service is in the context of our business, obviously. Uh, their problems become my problems. So um, that's probably what I would say, say to that one. How about 60 year old Phil Robertson? What advice would you give to yourself right now? If you were to think well, of it that way, I read an interesting article today on how the well, 50 year old advice would Trevor give to himself at 30. Uh, so hold on. If I, are you saying what advice would I give my younger self? If I yeah. One way to look is you always look back on things, but uh, another way I looked, I read about it today was if you were to think of it from your future self, what advice would you give yourself today? Okay. Uh, I, I think about this a bunch actually, and I especially think about it in the context of my family. My future self would say, make sure you're spending time with your family. Mm -hmm. And it is something that I've struggled with. I'm, I, lo I love my job. I work hard and sometimes I work a lot of hours. And so my, I know my future self, the number one thing it would tell me is spend time with your kids when they're young, mm. spend time with your family, even, even make sure you spend some time for yourself and, and don't just make it all about the business and all about the work. Because you gotta enjoy it too, right? <laughs> I, that's the thing, I do enjoy it though. That's why it can easily become all consuming. Ah, uh, yes. It's more about making sure you've got a balance and I mean, you know, because I'm, because I enjoy it and because I feel very driven, it can become very consuming. And so, and again, I, I'm pretty sure that's what my future self would tell me. It's like, mm -hmm. take time away from the business to do other things, balance your life. Otherwise you'll regret it. That's what I'm pretty sure my future self would tell me. Well, that's pretty good. I, as we uh, get to the end here, I, that's a, Cool snapshot of you guys. One last uh, topic is worst advice. What's the worst advice you've ever been given? Start a business to make money. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> That's the worst idea. 
I really believe that that's a, a, a recipe for failure. Mm. If you're planning to get into business to make money, so you've already failed. Not really? Yeah. You need to get into business to, to do something that you believe in, to add value to the world. For sure. And then you will, if you do it all right, you'll make money as a byproduct. Mm. If your goal is making money and that's your primary goal, then it's just not going to work. Yeah. People are going to see through that. People are, you know, it's not, it's not going to be successful. Mm. You have to believe in the value first, money second. So, I mean, I guess it's a, it's a backhanded uh, way of giving bad advice, but the bad advice is, you know, start the, the money. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's awesome. I really appreciate it, Phil. We'll wrap things up there. It won't take too much more of your time, but thanks for doing this. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. It was a great conversation. Maybe we can do part two in a few months and uh, yeah. pick good. your brain. Yeah. Already will leave it there. Okay, sure. Uh, one sec here. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think I got to go track down what Sebastian needed here. Yeah. Um, I'll hit. Uh, whoops. One sec. Oh, sorry. <laughs>